The NBA has its fair share of dark moments and embarrassing moments that league executives would rather like you to forget. There's great moments that we're all going to remember, like LeBron winning his first title with the Cavs, or Jordan's final shot as a Bull, and even Larry Bird getting his 69th dunk. Nice. But there's still plenty of moments throughout league history that really don't get brought up all that often. So keep watching to find out four moments that the NBA would rather make you forget. Malice at the Palace The events of November 19th, 2004 at the Palace of Auburn Hills are forever burned into the memory of NBA fans who were at least old enough to remember it. That season, the Pacers and Pistons were bitter rivals and fighting for supremacy in the Eastern Conference. The scrappy and physical Pistons were just coming off their historic 2004 Finals win of the Lakers the year prior, and were looking to do it again with the legendary core of Ben Wallace, Chauncey Billups, and Richard Hamilton. But this year's Pistons are jealous with their sad bottom of the Eastern placement today. The Pacers, on the other hand, were out for revenge. They had just lost to the Pistons in six games the year before in the Eastern Conference Finals, despite posting one of the best regular season records in the league. But this looked to be their year. Going into November 19th, Indiana was off to a 6-2 start and looking better than ever thanks to performance from young stars like Ron Artest, Steven Jackson, and Jermaine O'Neal. This core group were looking like they were going to carry the torch for the franchise after an aging Reggie Miller was set to retire following that season. As expected, the game was physical like a boxing match, low scoring like a middle school game, and hostile like a turf war between the two teams. Tensions were high, and with less than a minute left in the fourth and Indiana up 15, it unraveled. Artesta was being his usual trash talking self all game long and getting under the Pacers' skin, but it was his last play of the game that really set things off. Wallace ended up diving for a layup and got fouled hard by Artest and by that point, he'd had enough of his antics. Wallace gave Artest a vicious two-handed shove, which ended up leading to a short scuffle between the two teams. Wallace's teammates did their best to try and calm him down and attempted to separate him from the Pacers' bench. Meanwhile, Artest decided that it was time to lay down on the scorer's table and ignore Wallace to avoid any further confrontation. After all, he was already one minute away from being in a serious suspension thanks to his usual misconduct and unpredictable behavior on the court. Of course, that was not going to last. A Pistons fan named John Green made the fatal decision to throw a beer from his seat at Artest, and the rest, well, it's history. Artest charged up the bleachers in Green's direction, mistakenly grabbing the next guy to him and took him to the ground. Artest pummeled him and yelled, Did you do it? To which the fan tried to deny. Then Green came up behind Artest and tried to put him in a headlock, at which point another fan threw his drink at Artest, but really ended up spraying Steven Jackson, who was standing nearby. Jackson responded as you might expect, throwing an absolute haymaker at the fan's head, and security guards spent the next few moments trying to separate the fans from the players. Artest and Jackson were then escorted to the floor, but the fight was far from over. In a chaotic sequence, two Pistons fans made their way onto the court to be able to confront Artest on his way back over to the locker room. A screaming match between Artest and the fans ensued, then ended up escalating in Artest punching one of those fans in the face and knocking him to the ground. Then, Jermaine O'Neal charged at the other fan and tried to land his own punch, but luckily for the fan, O'Neal slipped on the way over and only glanced the side of the fan's face. It's hard to imagine what kind of damage a running punch from a 6'11 NBA center would cause, but luckily, we didn't have to see it. The Pacers coaching staff ended up escorting their players to the locker room, but not before walking through a volley of beers and other projectiles, which were being thrown by Pistons fans on the way. Ben run up to Ron and pushed his head out to the parking lot, and as soon as he calmed down, a beer came and hit him dead in the face. He just lost it. I didn't think twice. Went in there, laid a couple guys out. But the funniest part about it is going to make all y'all laugh. We get in the locker room. Ron's sitting there calming down. His first question to me, do you think we're going to get in trouble? The whole situation might seem funny to watch now, but Pistons coach Rick Carlisle was later quoted by saying, I felt like I was fighting for my life out there. The Mellows at the Palace was definitely a life-threatening situation for everybody involved. And as expected, David Stern and the NBA came down hard on the players that were involved in the brawl. Artest was suspended for the remainder of the season and the playoffs, while Steven Jackson was suspended for 30 games, O'Neal 25, and Wallace for 6. 
Our test would eventually go on to actually pick up a couple of battery charges, along with several other players, and in his absence, the Pacers' title's hopes were dashed. Ironically enough, they would actually end up losing to the Pistons in the playoffs that year, and the core that once made up the title-contending Pacers would eventually dissolve within a couple of seasons. The pacers piston brawl was probably the biggest disaster in NBA history, and the league is still hoping that nobody remembers. Lynn Bias's death There are only a handful of stories in the history of the NBA as tragic as the one about Lynn Bias. In 1986, the lottery pick and greatest NBA player who ever was tragically passed away. The Boston Celtics select Lynn Bias of the University of Maryland. In the mid-1980s, Bias was reviewed by league scouts as one of the most dynamic players in the nation while playing for the University of Maryland. Standing at 6'8 and playing small forward, Bias terrorized defenses as a small forward with his athleticism, ability to make plays, and leaping ability. After playing for four years at Maryland, Bias earned two All-American sectors and won ACC Player of the Year twice before being selected by the Celtics second overall in the 1986 draft. Analysis compared his athleticism to Michael Jordan, except he was only two inches taller. Celtics fans and players were ecstatic to have a player with his potential being able to come off the bench for Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale in the front court, and the C's look primed to win titles well into the future. Some fringe analysts praised his dunking ability to be able to compare to Larry Bird's, the undisputed dunk king. Sadly, Bias threw it all away in less than 24 hours after being drafted. The day after the draft at Madison Square Garden, Bias returned to the University of Maryland campus to party with his friends and teammates. And in the early morning hours of June 19, 1986, Bias and several of his teammates were doing lines of cocaine when one of their greatest college players overdosed, suffering a seizure and collapsed. He was unconscious and was not breathing when his friends called 911. Even the attempts to revive him as well as restore his breathing were unsuccessful. And officially, at 8.55 a.m., doctors had pronounced Lynn Bias dead from cardiac arrhythmia related to usage of cocaine. No other drugs or alcohol were ever found in the system. Bias's death shocked the world and changed everything about how college programs, along with how the NBA, handled their players, especially when it came to an obnoxious lack of oversight. Today, the league keeps rookies on a much shorter leash and even includes mandatory training on finances and decision-making to be able to prevent anything like Bias's death happening again. Latrell Sprewell's Choking Incident For several years, Latrell Sprewell was considered one of the best point guards in the league. But despite all-star selections, leading the Knicks to the NBA Finals in 1999, and even helping carry the Timberwolves to the Western Conference Finals in 2004, many fans had remembered him for only one infamous altercation while playing for the Warriors in the late 90s. In a moment that the league would rather have you forget, on the 1st of December 1997, Springwell was practicing with his teammates when Warriors coach P.J. Carl Simo reportedly ended up getting onto him about not throwing his passes hard enough. It was the coach's first season with Golden State, and he was apparently already riding Sprewell pretty hard. According to teammates, there were several altercations that PJ had apparently told Sprewell to quote, put a little mustard on his passes. Sprewell, known for having kind of a bad temper, didn't take it all that well. He was telling me he wasn't throwing passes hard enough, so it's embarrassing when a coach does that to you. The two started screaming at one another across the court, getting closer and closer until Sprewell boiled over and did the unthinkable. He reached out with his bare hands, grabbed his coach's neck like he thought that he was Darth Vader, and proceeded to choke the living crap out of him for the next 10 seconds. According to some teammates, Sprewell was so livid that he even threatened to kill him in broad daylight. Teammates and assistant coaches had to pull him off and, understandably, kick Sprewell out of practice for the day, but that wasn't all. After taking a shower and changing into his street clothes, the four-time All-Star had allegedly returned to the practice court and assaulted his coach a second time, this time landing a couple of punches on him and getting escorted out of the facility. A source had ended up telling the San Francisco Examiner, quote, if it had been a boxing match, his blows would have scored points. Sprewell never suited up for the Warriors again. The organization first gave him a 10-day suspension, but after the story blew up and made national headlines, they voided his three-year, $23.7 million contract two days later, and the NBA went so far as to suspend him for a full season. Sprewell's response didn't help either, because in an interview with 60 Minutes, he would go on to say that, quote, I wasn't choking PJ that hard. I mean, he could still breathe. 
It wasn't the end of Sprewell's career, however. He would eventually go on to butt heads with the next two franchises that he played for, the Knicks and Timberwolves respectively, and finally retired in 2005, although he was still a talented player. The incident ultimately tarnished his legacy, and David Stern was probably glad to see him gone. Jason Kidd's Legal History Hall of Famer Jason Kidd has had a mostly positive reception among fans for his flashy passes and status as one of the best point guards in history. But you might not know that Kidd also has got a troubled history of abuse and legal issues that the league and most fans tend to glance over. In 2001, while playing for the Phoenix Suns, Kidd was arrested on suspicion of domestic abuse after police had responded to a call for his now ex-wife, Jumana. According to police at the time, Jumana scolded him for taking a french fry off his son's plate while the family was at home. In an appalling turn of events, Kidd spat the french fry back at her face, then punched her directly in the mouth, prompting Jumana to call the kids. Kidd was arrested and would later plead guilty to spousal abuse. Even though he only paid $200 fine, he ended up taking anger management courses as part of his punishment. Jason and Jumana would later file a divorce in 2007, and Jumana went on to talk about suffering through years of being cheated on and abuse in court. Warning, some of the details are graphic. According to court documents, Jumana had stated that Jason Kidd would beat her on a regular basis before they even got married in 1997, and even assaulted him while she was pregnant with her first child. Jumana said that everything from a cookie to even a large rock would be used to assault her through their relationship. There was even an incident where Kidd repeatedly kicked Joanna in the stomach, which ended up causing blood to appear in her urine. Kidd was traded to the Nets not long after his arrest in 2001, but it wasn't the end of his legal troubles. In 2012, Kidd famously ran his SUV into a utility pole in Long Island while driving under the influence and only got suspended for two games. He's also famous for creating a screaming match with head coach Byron Scott in 2003 and running him out of town, despite the next going two straight finals in 2002 and 2003. The NBA might want you to remember Kidd as a great player and teammate, but there is a reason that his personal life doesn't get mentioned. Final Thoughts Just like any other league, the NBA does have its fair share of toxicity, and as basketball continues to grow in popularity around the world, more stories like these are sure to come. But that's it for now. Tune in for more NBA content just like this and subscribe to Dunk Channel and watch out for more future videos by hitting that notification bell. Thanks for sticking around, guys. See you later.